let's go ahead and get started for the sake of time. Um, I'm Molly Bridges, a senior event planner here at SoFi, and I'll be firing away questions uh, at my coworker, Brian. So Brian Walsh is uh, the senior manager of our financial planning team and a certified financial planner at SoFi. Brian, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to talk about credit cards. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Um, so let's just let's just hit the ground running and start with a little bit of con uh, context around what is credit card debt to begin with and how can one begin to accrue it? Yeah, so I guess before I, I hop in and start responding, I, I don't want to I don't want to get in trouble with compliance. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I lead the financial planning team here at SoFi. Um, I'm a certified financial planner, but you know, nothing that I talk about today should be looked at as financial advice. Like think about this high level education guidance, stuff like that. Um, but for anyone who's on the call, I'm like, hey, I want to figure out a game plan for my own situation. What exactly should I do? Uh, you can always schedule a call with one of our financial planners um, to, to kind of go through that. So yeah, I guess like a high level, like looking at credit card debt, um, you know, there's a handful of different ways that, that I've seen people get into credit card debt. Um, like the default is like, oh, wow, that person must be overspending. And you know, they have a shopping problem or whatever it may be. And like, yeah, that does happen. Overspending does lead to credit card debt from time to time. But to be honest with you, sometimes it happens because of, you know, life just happens. Someone loses the job or they have medical bills or, you know, the car breaks down. You need to fix the car and you don't have an emergency fund. So there's, you know, there's a mixture of like valid reasons as well as like overspending reasons on why people get into credit card debt. Um, but at a high level, we look at credit card debt as, you know, anything that's on, you know, revolving credit where it's unsecured, you don't have like a finite period of time that you have to pay it back. And, you know, typically we see pretty high interest rates with credit cards. Really helpful level setting, uh, Brian. And you know, while we know credit card debt is really prevalent, uh, CNBC recently reported that 54% of adults carry a credit card balance from month to month, and 50% of those people um, have been in credit card debt for at least the year. Um, and we think that's really often not spoken about. What do you think are some of the common misconceptions about credit card debt? Yeah, I, I think the first, first misconception, I, I, I have three. Um, number one would be that like credit card debt is always that person's fault. And it, it's both like externally looking at someone who has credit card debt, but also like internally. Like it, I got into you know credit card debt uh, early on in my career and like I was beating myself up over. I'm like, man, I am an idiot. I can't believe what I did. So it's not always gonna be that type of situation. Um, number two, some people feel like credit card debt is like, I don't know, I go back to like those cartoons back in the day and I might be dating myself where like, there was like a safe or a piano like hanging over like the cartoon character's head. Like people feel like that when it comes to credit card debt, like they're never gonna get away from it. And it just, it creates all this stress and anxiety. Um, and then number three from a misconception um, would be that it's okay to spend on a credit card if you have credit card debt. I think that is like the biggest surefire way um, to kind of sabotage getting out of credit card debt is if you're carrying a balance from month to month, spending on that credit card to get like points or whatever it may be, like those points just aren't worth it. So those, those would probably be the three biggest misconceptions that I see related to credit card debt. Really helpful. And I think we'll get to some of those points later on in this section. Um, alongside that, can you explain how credit card debt might differ from other debt, say like student loans? Yeah, so I, at a high level, we typically look at like debt and we break it up into like two buckets. Like we, we think there's good debt and there's bad debt. So like good debt generally comes with like low interest rates um, and it results from like investing in your earning power through student loans or purchasing an asset like with a mortgage. Bad debt, on the other hand, we typically view it as it's gonna come with high interest rates um, and it typically comes from, you know, other reasons, not related to like investing in your earning power or investing in an asset. Um, some of the key ways that, you know, credit card debt differs from almost every other type of debt is number one, it, it's one of the more challenging debts to carry because there's not a payoff date. 
So that kind of payment is up to you. Like granted the credit card company has a minimum payment, but that'll take a long, long time to pay off if you just make the minimum payment. And number two, they typically come with pretty high interest rates. So that makes paying it back even that much tougher and really kind of eats into your budget. Um, and then number three, credit cards, you know, have a pretty big impact on your credit score uh, because credit utilization is a, a key component of your credit score, which is basically like how much credit limit do you have versus how much you're carrying. And that's one of like the quickest ways to impact your score either positively or negatively. I think that's a that's a really great helpful explanation. And I think too, um, we'll dig into the different types um, of credit card debt you could potentially get into. But I think just setting the base of understanding what credit card debt is, is a great way to kind of segment into our second um, bucket of today's webinar, which is, okay, now that I have credit card debt, what do I do about it? And so um, there are plenty of ways to pay off your credit card debt, but not all are obviously created equal. If you wanna tackle your debt head on, you'll need to consider things like interest rates, fees, how much you can afford to pay before settling on your best repayment option. Ryan, how would you go about deciding which one is right for you? And really what are your options? Yeah, a lot of times when we interact with people who have credit card debt, um, you know, they, some people kind of look for like a silver bullet or like, a, you know, an overnight type of thing. And, and a lot of times like paying off credit card debt, it's a, it's a, you know, could be a longer, harder process. Um, there's different options out there. Uh, we'll kind of go through them. Like at a high level, I think of um, just simply kind of paying it off based on, on what you have. Like, hey, I have, you know, four credit cards with, you know, $10,000 of balance, like just paying that off with extra payments. Um, another option would be like a balance transfer um, type of approach. So you would transfer your balance to like a 0% card. So that way you could pay it off a little bit quicker because you're not paying interest. Um, another option would be, you know, using a personal loan to, to pay it off and consolidate it. And then finally, and you know, the final option would be like, hey, tapping into like a retirement account or equity in your home, stuff like that. So there's no one size fits all. Like I always feel bad, like with personal finance, like people probably want a super direct answer. Like this will always be the best option. And, and that's not the case with credit card debt. Um, all of them have pros and cons. So like going through that list, thinking about the pros and cons, like, you know, thinking about, okay, I have credit card debt, paying it off. I'm going to just keep the credit, the first option, keeping the credit cards and I'm gonna make extra payments. Um, Number one, the benefits of this is it's probably the, the simplest. Like it doesn't require doing too much else other than just related to the credit cards you have. Uh, the downside of this is it really relies on your own discipline, your own willpower to do it. Um, you can do some things to automate this, but it's, it's, it's kind of something that you have to set up. Um, and you know, typically it tends to be pretty pretty costly because your credit card's still charging, you know, 18, 20, whatever percent interest rate um, while you're paying it off. So every month, you're not just paying towards principal, you're also paying a good chunk of interest. And the second one, kind of, um, you know, thinking through the different options, like balance transfer credit card. Um, that's something that we, we get asked about a lot. Um, and the general idea is like, hey, maybe I have, you know, a credit card or two or whatever, they're charging like 20%. What if I got just this offer in the email or the mail, um, 0%, and then you know, I transfer my balance over, I pay a transfer fee, but I don't have to pay interest for a certain period of time. Uh, the pros of that is assuming that balance transfer fee is reasonable, um, it could allow you to save money on interest or fees compared to like that high interest rate on you know, normal credit card. The cons of this is similar to the credit card, it's going to require you having the discipline or a system in place to pay it off before the introductory period ends. Because that in, that 0% doesn't last forever. You're typically looking at like 12, 18, maybe 24 months. So it's about figuring out, hey, I need to pay this off in that time period in order for this to make sense. Um, and then the other con would be the balance transfer fees. Uh, a lot of people ignore the balance transfer fees and then it like kind of hits them once they actually do it. Uh, so make sure you, you look and see what the fee would be. Uh, the third option, kind of talk about personal loans. Um, a lot of times this can be advantageous for people because 
Um, essentially, if the idea is like, hey, I got 10 grand in credit card debt, um, it's charged me 20%, I'm gonna take out a personal loan for $10,000, pay off the credit card, and ideally that interest rate on the personal loan is lower, so it saves you money on interest. Uh, the pros here are number one, you know, typically they're gonna be the interest rate. And number two, people overlook this, like it gives you a fixed repayment period. Like with a personal loan, you say, hey, it's gonna be five years. It says, here's your monthly payment to pay it off in five years. Unlike a credit card, which is really kind of open-ended. The con side of things is um, you're still gonna pay interest. And if you're not careful, it could be a slippery slope to get back into credit card debt when now you have a personal loan and you have a credit card to pay off in a couple of years. So if you do the personal loan route, we typically encourage you like, do not use your credit card for spending until this personal loan's paid off. Um, and then the other options like tapping into retirement plan, taking out a loan or taking out a, you know, a home equity line of credit against the house. The pros here would be, you know, the interest rates are, you know, typically going to be much, much lower. So save you money on interest. Um, the cons would be that kind of, I don't know, and whenever you tap into an asset to pay off credit card debt, you're kind of, you, you're taking from Peter to pay Paul in a sense where it can impact that goal or, or that side of your financial picture. Really helpful to walk through all the different pros and cons of each. And I think folks here who are joining live can kind of apply that to their own individual situation and kind of help figure out what's best for them. Um, switching gears a little bit into, um, let's say someone wants to build wealth and continue to um, improve on their financial literacy literacy in parallel with paying off their credit card debt between saving or investing or retirement crypto which should you prioritize first and why <laughs> yeah so here uh, earlier i said like we we don't really have like oh this is what you should do all the time in personal finance um when it comes to like prioritization we spend a lot of time in this so we do have pretty clear viewpoint on what should happen i think first and foremost like the number one priority for anyone should be making sure they have at least one month's worth of expenses in cash. So, you know, looking at the credit card debt, the focus of this conversation, even if you have credit card debt, it's very important to have that one month worth of expenses in cash because that serves as your safety net. It's kind of like the cushion between something unexpected happening and being in a really, really tough spot financially. So we typically look at that as number one. Um, number two would be, you know, taking advantage of your employer match. Um, again, even with credit card debt, um, that's also something that we, we highly encourage because an employer match is typically going to be like the highest rate of return you're ever going to get on your money. Like even if it's a 50% match, like that is a very, very powerful incentive to save. Um, number three, making sure your income is protected, like disability insurance, life insurance, stuff like that. And then number four would be credit cards and other bad debt. So if you have credit card debt, then we would go through those first steps and say, okay, do you have a safety net? Are you taking advantage of the employer match? You know, is your income protected with disability insurance? Okay, cool. Then we're focusing on credit card debt. We are focusing typically on credit card debt before we're doing any other type of investing or saving or whatever it may be. So that's probably something that a lot of people um, question, like, hey, I need to save and invest for the future. Um, outside of that, maximizing that employer match, um, you're just typically not going to earn en enough by investing in order to offset those high interest rates that you are going to be paying by carrying a credit card balance from month to month. Wow, that's that's a great explanation on that. And I think uh, a lot of folks actually had that question in the in the chat box and in the previous um, registration questionnaire. So I'm sure a lot of people are shaking their head yes at that. Um, great. So let's say you have multiple credit cards to potentially pay off. Do you have a theory on what's the best strategy, highest rate first or highest balance first? Yeah. So the, this one's this is going to make me sound super nerdy and, and full disclosure, like I am a financial planning nerd. Like I'm working on my PhD in, in, in personal finance. So I love reading random research and like at the end of the day, like it seems like there's like two camps. And it's either like the snowball approach to paying down credit card debt or the avalanche approach to paying down credit card debt. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with, with those two approaches, the avalanche approach basically says, hey, look at your debt and then rank it from highest interest rate to lowest interest rate and start make minimum payments on everything. And then you prioritize extra payments towards the debt with the highest interest rate. So that's avalanche. Snowball 
works differently. Snowball says, hey, list out all your, you know, your, your, your debt accounts and then order them from smallest balance to largest balance and you know, make minimum payments, but then you throw all your extra money at that balance that's the smallest. So both have pros and cons. Like Avalanche, you start with the highest interest rate. So like mathematically, that is the most efficient approach to paying down credit card debt. But we're not robots. Like if we were robots, we would be a lot better off when it comes to making financial decisions, like myself included. Like we all have emotion that is really, really impactful to everything we do with our finances. The snowball approach really keys in on like human nature and human behavior. It's not the most, most mathematically you know, efficient, but you see progress quicker because you start with the smallest balance. And what research shows is progress leads to persistence when it comes to goals. So typically I would encourage people to take the snowball type of approach, start with the smallest balance, then move on to the next smallest, then move on to the next smallest, because you're going to gain momentum as you go. And if it really boils down to it, like the difference mathematically isn't really that big. So long-winded way of saying probably start with smallest balance and move on from there, um, because human behavior is oftentimes more important than just crunching numbers. Yeah, continue with the theme of there's no silver silver bullet here, which I think makes makes a lot of sense. Um, and the financial psychology behind that is also just really interesting. Uh, it's helpful to know that when when deciding between the two. Um, we discussed this a little bit earlier, but diving into credit score, how is that affected by credit card debt? And is it true that some debt is good debt? Yeah. Um... So I guess we'll hit on the good debt versus bad debt. Like, yes, we do view there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. And I, I guess like debt can be good within reason. Um, you know, generally good debt is something that enhances your earning power, um, goes towards an asset, um, and generally carries like low interest rates. That being said, like if, I mean, the debt could be good, but if you have like, I don't know, like let's say, you're making $50,000 a year and you have a million dollar mortgage, technically, yes, a mortgage could be good, but that amount of the mortgage could be bad. So um, debt can be good in moderation as long as it fits in expenses. As far as credit score, um, credit cards have a pretty big impact on, on your credit score. So I touched on credit utilization earlier, and that is um, a leading component or a leading factor towards people credit, people's credit scores. Um, so essentially it's, hey, what's my total credit limit? How much do I have outstanding? And then whatever that percentage is, that's your credit utilization ratio. Um, and the general rule of thumb is, hey, if it's over 30%, like that really, really hurts your score, uh, brings it down. And then as you get lower from 30%, closer to 0%, and that can improve your score. Um, also like making on time and in full payments to a credit card, um, and that's based on your minimum payment, um, it has an impact on credit score because payment history comes into play. And then also just applying for new credit cards and stuff like that's a new credit inquiry. So that could also impact your score because credit inquiries factor in your score as well. That's perfect. And perfect timing with uh, Nicole in the chat. She asks, when you get your credit cards down to zero and you wanna make sure that you don't have that temptation to use one again, how can you close out an account without significantly affecting your credit score? Great question. Yeah, it, it is a great question. Um, you know, this is where it kind of, it, it becomes a little bit challenging, right? Because a lot of people, they ask that question because they're like, hey, if I close out all my credit cards, my credit score is going to take a hit. And that might be true. I mean, it depends on, probably is true based on, you know, your, your overall credit profile and everything. Um, because like, let's say if you close out those credit cards, what would end up happening is it would, it could, I guess I, I won't say it would, it could reduce the average age of your, of your credit. Like, let's say if it's, I have a credit card from like back in the day, it was actually the credit card that got me into trouble in uh, my early twenties. So this thing's like 15 years old and it boosts my average age of credit, which is actually a positive thing for your credit score. So if I canceled that credit card, then in theory, everything else remains the same. My score is going to go down a little bit. Um, and also another aspect where this could impact your credit score is going back to that same credit card. I have a credit limit on it that doesn't use any of it. Um, 
And if I close that out, that credit limit gets removed and therefore my credit utilization ratio could go up, which could impact my score. So generally speaking, um, if it doesn't, it, especially if you're, you're not paying a fee for the credit card um, and it's an older credit card, then it might be advantageous just to keep it open, do some essential spending on it, set it to automatically pay off in full every month if you can avoid the temptation um, of you know, using it. So in those cases, hey, maybe you um, set up like auto pay or something, like pay a subscription from it, but don't carry the credit card with you. Stuff like that can be helpful. But if you're paying a fee on the credit card, then it typically maybe you might want to consider ditching it. Someone also just asked um, to piggyback off of that in the chat. It, do you have to actually pay um, something with that credit card or can you just leave it and leave it open but not use it? Uh, yeah, so that, uh, honestly, it depends on the credit card company and okay. what else you have with that organization. Um, they can, like if you don't use it, um, you know, they, they can, you know, close it out and then you don't even have that decision. They basically just shut it off. It would be like you kind of canceling it. Um, so generally speaking, you would want to like use it maybe for small infrequent purchases that again, you pay off in full every month. Maybe you don't even carry it with you, stuff like that. Like that, that, you know, my, my legacy credit card that I mentioned, um, what subscription do I have that I, that I use to pay for? I think like my Netflix subscription. Yeah. Right, I, I legit, I think that's the only thing is like Netflix or something else. And then I, I have an auto pay where it pays off the balance in full every month and it just kind of just keeps it open. That's a great idea. That's super helpful. Like the Spotify, the Netflix, the HBOs of the world, take notes. Um, great, Jamie asks the question, when it comes to utilization, what is more important to focus on? Overall utilization or individual utilization by card? Yeah. Um, Gosh, I, I like the, the key metric here when it comes to your credit score is your overall utilization. Like, hey, Brian has a credit limit of $10,000. He currently, in between, like, let's say I have five cards at two grand a piece. So I have five cards at $10,000. It looks at my overall balance. Let's say it's two grand out of that 10,000, it's 20%. That 2,000 could be on all one card. Um, you know, it, so again, I think like it's the overall utilization that we tend to, to focus on. Um, but then at the same time, like your utilization for each card, it all adds up. So we tend to see people focus on as they're paying it off, focusing on one at a time. And it, I think it'd be very advantageous to track your, your progress on each individual card rather than add a whole, because you're going to see progress quicker when you look at one card and then you get excited. You're like, Hey, you know, things are actually going well here. And it, it's more, again, the emotional game. So as I'm paying off credit card debt. I would focus on one at a time and track that progress to keep incentivized and motivated. And then, you know, but from a credit score, it's overall. Great, that's that's really helpful. One, thank you, Brian. And two, thank you uh, everyone in the chat and in the Q&A who are asking questions. This is making this conversation a lot more fruitful. So continue to do so. Um, great, so I think we can begin to move now into the third bucket, which is how to prevent credit card debt in the future. Um, so let's start off by what are some good habits or maybe um, essential tips that you would encourage folks to take to make sure that this isn't happening to them in the future, or if you haven't had credit card debt yet, what you can do to prevent it? Yeah, the, the two things I, I typically go to is number one, paying with cash, and number two, tracking your finances. Um, so paying with cash, and it, like this, this may make me sound like an old person because like I like who uses cash these days, I guess. But at the end of the day, like subconsciously, how you pay for something actually impacts how much you spent. It's this concept called the pain of pain. And it basically kind of looks at saying like, hey, if you pay for something with cash, you experience the most pain because you're physically handing cash to someone and it's immediate. Like you feel that right away subconsciously. On the flip side, like a credit card, you feel the least amount of pain when you use a credit card to pay for something because it's a piece of plastic, like it's not tangible um, and it's not immediate because you won't actually see it in, unless you check your online, like you don't see that until your statement comes, you know, maybe a month later. The amount of pain you experience when you pay for something directly impacts how much you spend. So normally pain is bad in this sense to avoid getting a credit card debt, 
pain is good. So if you have trouble spending, then cash, debit card, no credit card, essentially. Um, so that'd be the first way. The second way would be using technology to accomplish something similar. Um, so think about like, I'm biased, like I work for SoFi, I think SoFi Relay is really cool. Um, there's other personal financial management tools out there, whatever you're gonna use, just use it. So if you are using a debit card um, or if you are using a credit card, tracking your spending by linking your accounts and kind of budgeting in an app like that can be a very, very good way to stay on top of your finances. And again, know what's going on and experience that pain in real time which prevents overspending. So I think whether or not you use cold hard cash or you use technology, um, I think either approach, it, it's, it's all about being mindful and making that tangible and making it immediate when you make purchases, because if you don't have that, it's really easy to overspend. Trust me, I just, I, I just reviewed my budget from uh, last month and I saw what I spent on Amazon because the damn one click buying, it always gets me. There's no pain associated with making those purchases and I overspent. So I need to step my game up. I completely agree. I recently added um, a notification to text me every time I spend something on my credit card. And that has been a huge game changer as well. I get the pain physically in my hand every day. Um, well, those were fantastic tips, Brian. We really appreciate this. And for those of you in the chat who are asking, yes, a recording is coming. So if you had to drop early, not no worries. We will be sending that out afterwards. Um, any last kind of final parting thoughts, Brian, that you can impart on our audience? Yeah, I, I think one area um, would be, you know, looking at ways to automate. So I mentioned like technology for staying on top of, um, you know, your spending and things like that. Uh, in a, in a kind of a, a similar approach, using technology to be like your best friend and essentially related to finances can be very important because a lot of times people try to like brute force it, like take a brute force to saving or paying down debt or whatever it may be. And like some people can do that, but most of the time, like that just creates like mental fatigue and just leads to mistakes and slip ups and stuff like that. So instead we encourage people to, to automate it. So if you have credit card debt, maybe you automatically make an extra payment amount. Um, you could do the same thing with, you know, personal loan or investing or whatever it may be. But I think, you know, taking that approach to using technology to stay on top of your finances and automate what's important to you financially, that way you can make a good decision once and then you feel the benefits for months or even years as opposed to actually having to make that good decision every single month because it, it can get pretty tiring. That's a great takeaway and a great tip. Um, and as Brian said earlier, make sure to check out um, our financial planners and schedule a, a complimentary call with them. And uh, people just like Brian can help answer any questions you guys have. Um, I use it. I love it. It's a great member benefit that SoFi offers. Uh, and with that being said, I think we're almost at time. So just want to give another big thanks to having Brian here. Brian, that was super helpful. And I know a lot of our members had their questions answered. Uh, and thank you to all of our members who joined us. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to join up financial webinar. And if you have more questions, don't hesitate to reach out and we can perhaps do a part two. Uh, we have additional member events in your app under member experiences. So we hope to see you back at another one soon. Mm -hmm.